Hey everyone, we're gonna get started in just a couple minutes here. I'm gonna wait for everyone to sort of roll in and uh, and then we will get right to it. And um, my lovely assistant, Sarah, will be assisting me more than she usually does today because I only have one screen. Oh, gasp, I know, only one screen today. So I'm not gonna be able to um, to watch the Q&A or the chat. So Sarah, you're gonna have to stop me and uh, cause you know, I'll just keep talking. Do that. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So let's go ahead and get rolling. All right, everybody. So if you join today to learn how to build a CMMC compliance program, then you are in the right place. So let's jump in. All right, today we're going to, to, to cover how to determine the initial and ongoing cost of compliance, a systematic way that's going to clarify how long it will take to get to that 110 score that everyone's trying to get to at level two, uh, the, the easiest way to implement CMMC. And I'll also uh, tell you a little bit about the secrets to understanding just what um, they're looking for in the program. So if you're here, you probably know who I am, but just in case you joined and you're not sure, um, I'm Leah Shilabot. I'm the founder and um, CEO and the CISO, CISO here at Intech Solutions. I founded the company as a security-focused MSP back in 2006. Um, and um, I was actually thrilled when I found out that my clients were in, um, a lot of them were in the defense industrial base, and they um, needed to have the cybersecurity compliance. At first, it was just NIST 800-171, and then CMMC came. And uh, for those of us that are on the call thinking, why were you thrilled? I was thrilled because um, we were security focused, so we had our standards and best practices, but when um, we were required to align with CMMC and NIST 800-171, instead of it being uh, just like kind of like Leia's best practices, which, you know, those are pretty good. Um, now we actually have um, a control set uh, that was created by people who are way smarter than me. And so we had a really great confidence in what it was we were implementing in aligning environments. So I love compliance and I love CMMC. And um, yes, the world needs people like me. And uh, that's why you're all here is to learn just how much I love this and the things that we've done to implement. I'm also the author of the CMMC IT Documentation Toolkit, which is um, a CMMC compliance program. And, um, and it's also, we also help organizations to implement that. So today I am gonna show you um, part of how we build and maintain CMMC compliance programs for our clients for best outcomes. Um, and this is not the only way to build or manage a compliance program. And maybe you do have a better way. If you do, um, I would like you to share it so we all get better together. Remember that we're all on the same side here. We're trying to secure our organizations so that our adversaries don't get our information or blow up our businesses. So if you know a good way to do something, let everyone know about it. So let's start by getting ourselves in the right frame of mind to be able to think about compliance programs. So if we could sum up what the cybersecurity maturity model certification, what CMMC is in just like a sentence, what would you say? Well, when I talk about it, I succinctly describe it this way. It's a cybersecurity compliance program that was created to protect federal contract information, FCI, and controlled unclassified information, CUI, for private industry that, is, that are in the Department of Defense's supply chain. That's a very high level, concise way of describing it, but it's important because that's what we are doing. We are creating a cybersecurity compliance program. It's not just a checklist. If you see this as a checklist, um, 
then the effort that you put into it, which is a, a, a significant effort, you're not going to end up getting the benefits if you just see it as a checklist or something to just kind of like, you know, check the boxes in the, and pencil that in, you know, pencil whip, I guess is what I've heard in the past. Um, if you see it as a cybersecurity compliance program, you actually get a lot more benefit. We're going to talk about why that is. So what is a cybersecurity compliance program? So cybersecurity compliance um, typically involves meeting a lot of different controls, control sets that uh, are often enacted by a regulatory authority, law, or an industry group um, and protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data, which we call the, uh, the CIA triad. Um, so at its core with cybersecurity compliance is, is going to be adhering to those standards and those regulatory requirements set forth by some organization. Usually cybersecurity compliance is an external organization that's telling you like an agency, law, authority group, and I've even seen industry groups um, require cybersecurity compliance for their members. Um, I've actually, I've seen big OEMs also have certain cybersecurity compliance requirements for um, the people in, or the organizations in their supply chain uh, this is just in private industry, it has nothing to do with defense. And so um, this is coming everywhere. Um, now, before we, uh, before we go on, um, what's interesting is that um, while cybersecurity programs should be protecting the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data, the government is, more, is mostly concerned about the confidentiality of the data that you um, are a custodian of, or um, they often refer to that as an authorized holder of the information. So confidentiality is what the government is most concerned about. And so the controls, although um, are, are very much focused on addressing the, the C, confidentiality in that triad. So let, let's put us in the mind frame of like some compliance requirements. So we know there's CMMC, PCI, DSS, HIPAA, GDPR, GBLA, GLBA, uh, SOX, the FTC safeguards, FERPA, FINRA. So like the, the, these things, none of this is new, right? Compliance is everywhere. CMMC is just one of them. And there, then there are control frameworks. So the first thing is the, all those letters are going to be the... Um, the potential requirement for like a program. And control frameworks are things like NIST 800-171 or 853, 866, uh, the Secure Controls Framework or SCF, CIS controls, ISO 27001, and the NIST CSF, the Cybersecurity Framework uh, and COVID. So what's the difference between a control framework and a cybersecurity compliance requirement? The cybersecurity compliance requirement is a mandate to protect the information. And then the control framework provides the control set to give guidance on how you're gonna meet that compliance requirement. And remember, like I said earlier, control frameworks are created by teams of really smart people. So when you're implementing that control framework, you have a better level of confidence than just creating your own standards. And standards are hugely important if we're trying to protect anything, uh, whether that is you know, our people, our technology, our information, our, uh, our businesses from a physical perspective. But oftentimes people think and feel like cybersecurity compliance is really hard. So why is it being perceived like it's hard to do this? Well, uh, oftentimes in my experience, I see that, um, that sometimes requirements can overlap leading to confusion or more work. So um, perhaps you know, you're required to implement CMMC at level two, but, um, but one of your customers has additional um, requirements for you as well. Um, maybe some of the ISO things that you're implementing could also overlap with CMMC, especially when you talk about things like risk management. Um, the other issue that we see is that oftentimes technical people are approaching this thinking it's a tool. So they'll look at the control set for 800-171. They see things like um, access control and identity and authentication or 
a protecting endpoint. And so immediately they're thinking it's a tool. What is the list of things that I have to buy and implement to meet this? And then on the other side, managers um, who really should be champions for a cybersecurity program are often feeling like it's this unnecessary headache. And why do we have to do this? Why do we have to go through all these gyrations? How fast can we get to the end? And, and then there's a lack of a structured approach. So all of those things combined makes cybersecurity compliance feel really hard. So let's talk about how we can make it a little bit easier. Um, so first thing is to think about the benefits of your program, okay? So instead of thinking about it, you gotta put yourself in the right mindset. Instead of thinking of it as like a millstone around your neck, think about the good things about it first and, and always see that in, when you're approaching your program and program design. It does protect your company reputation, right? Has anybody ever gotten like a, an email from an, an organization, a vendor, a supplier, someone like that, that you, is a trusted source for you? And clearly somebody hacked into their email and is sending out emails on their behalf, right? You, you like you might like this company, but now you're like, hmm, I wonder like really how their security is there if you know this just happened to them. But clearly they don't have MFA or if they do, it was not set up properly. So you're already thinking those things about organizations that do that, um, that, that have those kind of breaches. You don't want anyone to think of like that about you. So recognizing that it protects your reputation is huge. Um, it also maintains customer and client trust because they know that you have a certain level of a standard and it's not just a, you know, like, sure, we do a good job. You can point to a control set and say, we've implemented this. It also builds customer confidence and loyalty. It absolutely 100% does. When they know that you care about the confidentiality uh, and of the information that they entrust you with, um, they definitely feel better about doing business with you and sending you their important information. Um, it also helps identify, interpret, and prepare for potential data breaches. And those are incredibly expensive, whether it's uh, a breach of information like um, protected health information or personally identif identifiable information, which there are laws around, um, or it is a breach that, uh, in, that has something to do with um, the government's information that you're a holder of. If you are identifying those ahead of time, you can avoid much, much costly breaches. And it also improves your overall security posture. So while compliance and security are two different things, they do overlap. Um, so by implementing cybersecurity compliance program, you, um, you do up-level your entire or level up your entire uh, organization security. And the fact of the matter is that these benefits impact directly the organization's bottom line. So if you have good reputation, loyal customers who are confident in you, they're gonna talk about you. So you're going to be well-known, you're gonna get more agreements, contracts, and more business just because of that reputation. So why do I keep talking about, in general, about cybersecurity? programs. Like we know that we're here to talk about CMMC. So why do I keep talking about all these generalities? Because here's the thing, guys, once you learn how to create a cybersecurity compliance program, you know how to create any cybersecurity compliance program. So see this opportunity for CMMC to, to really have a huge impact on your organization and implement all of the compliance requirements that you have into one program. Don't forget to communicate the, uh, the ROI for this cybersecurity compliance program. This is really key, guys, because a lot of organizations really see this as a burden. And while I agree that most organizations don't get really excited about cybersecurity compliance, that's my job, um, that we have to remember the reason why we're doing this, and it's not just to, to check a box. So these are some, these are some th important things for you to consider. The first, is that I've heard already from Stacey Bosjanic in the office of the DOD CIO that 40% of small businesses have dropped out the defense industrial base uh, since the cybersecurity requirements um, back in 2017. Uh, we're seeing that for two reasons. First is there is some con consolidation going on. Um, and the second is that some organizations 
looked at what the requirement was and say, you know what, I'm just not interested. I'm going to step away from this business. So that means that there's more opportunity for additional work and additional contracts because just because those organizations dropped out does not mean that that work does not have to be done. There is demand for the work to get done. Um, and trust me when I tell you that my clients are asking me, my customers ask me, they say, Leah, I need to find an approved supplier for plating, for um, you know, different uh, pieces of the manufacturing process that they know they're also going to be CMMC compliant. So there's a lot of organizations that are asking for those kind of referrals. And if you are able and capable of being able to fulfill those contracts, you absolutely are going to win more business. And guys, the recognize that compliance is coming and it's all in caps. It's not just CMMC. It isn't. In all industries, across the board, compliance is coming. Maybe if you decide to drop out and not do CMMC or have any government contracts, that's fine. This is going to come and get you anyway. And if you are already implementing a cybersecurity compliance program, you're going to be ahead of the game for all contracts because you're demonstrating that you care for the continuity of your business so that you can deliver on the, the things that you said you were going to provide for your customers and that you're gonna be able to protect your customer's information. So when you're starting to, um, to build this program, the most important thing is to assign an internal program owner. So this is really key guys, um, no matter what, if you decide to get help or try to handle everything internally, um, you have to have one person internally that is kind of overall accountable for the program. They don't have to do everything, but they have to be uh, accountable to assure that the things are getting done. So even if you if you engage an organization, like we do this for our clients, um, like mine, to be able to help you with your compliance program, there still has to be somebody internal that's owning that. You cannot abdicate compliance. Here's some examples of, um, of people who've been uh, assigned as an internal program uh, owner. Sometimes it's a security officer. Sometimes I've seen the quality assurance officer be assigned. Um, sometimes even the president or CEO of the company. Um, sometimes somebody in internal IT. And I've also seen organizations, larger organizations uh, like mid-market companies decide that they are gonna actually hire a program owner. You know, I'm seeing that in organizations that have like, you know, like a, a thousand plus um, employees. So um, that's not typical. And I would say that uh, if you have a smaller organization hiring somebody and that's their only job is to be a, a program owner, uh, they'll probably sit around and be bored. So that might not be the best use of, um, of your dollars to do that on a smaller scale. Um, make sure that you know your sources. So um, understand, don't just trust what people say. Um, you have to make sure that you know where to find source information. Uh, source information for the program can be found on the DOD CIO's site, um, also on the NIST site, and on the Federal Acquisition site, so where you can find the FARs and the DFARs. And you want to make sure that you know where to find these clauses uh, and these requirements. And, uh, and always use that as source documentation. Then you need to make sure that you follow a proven process. So this is our proven process that we use when we implement our compliance programs for our, for our clients. We always start by identifying the key data um, business processes and technology, which we need to know first to make sure that we are assessing the right things in that gap assessment to identify um, like a very, very, very uh, detailed and high confidence POAM. And then we look at the POAM and then we um, group everything into discrete projects. And then we implement the documentation in the compliance program. And um, our, um, our mechanism for, um, for that, for coming together to do those compliance activities and report is uh, what we, we refer to that as the risk management meeting. So we do all that in risk management meetings. So let's talk first about identifying key data technology um, and business processes. So um, what are we doing in this step? 
I always recommend that you interview the key people in the company to follow the data throughout the organization and make sure that you're talking to the people who own the processes. I've seen entirely too often where um, we're talking with um, IT or a CFO or um, another, another like manager in the organization and we're asking questions and they make assumptions about how that data is flowing. And then we actually talk to quoting, we actually talk to sales, we actually talk to engineering, we actually talk to you know, the quality person. And then we find out that what they, how they thought the information was flowing throughout the organization and coming in and leaving is actually different. So talk to people who own those processes to validate how the information flows. Um, identify the FCI and the CUI. And this is a key step here, right? Because the entire program is about protecting that information. And if we don't start with identifying what the CUI and FCI is, uh, then we're, we're not even going to maybe choose the right solutions or secure the right things. Um, so for, if you have an issue with trying to figure out what's the CUI is, which I hear sometimes as well, like, you know, I'm not really sure what the CUI is. Um, it's not marked. It's overmarked. Um, that can be a challenge. And I get that. But you have to start by deciding what you're going to treat as CUI. In some cases, um, organizations that I've worked with have decided that everything that comes from a specific customer will be treated as CUI. Uh, and that way they can say whatever, whatever comes in from them, we're not even going to guess. We're just going to treat it as CUI. And then you're safe by casting a wider net. Um, identify the key business processes that are associated with that data. So how is it flowing in? And when it flows in, who is it flowing to? Is it coming via email or a secured portal? Um, and, um, and then who, who downloads or receives that information? Where do they put it when they are looking at it? Um, and then where does it flow throughout the organization? Are you doing um, any design work? So do you get some specs and then you have to actually build a 3D model of that? Remember, if you're doing that, then you are actually creating CUI, right? Because the drawing that they sent is CUI and then your 3D model is also CUI. So you might be creating CUI in the process and you have to make sure that you're aware of that. And then that information is being stored and treated um, as CUI as well. There we go. Flow in to whom, where do they put it? What happens to the data next? Uh, where does it live in digital format? Ooh, who has access to it? That's really important. Who, who is authorized to access that information? What do they do with it? Does it get printed to a hard copy? Because hard copy CUI is still CUI. Um, so it has to be controlled too as it flows throughout the organization. Um, and then as it's traveling throughout the facility, um, is it ever secured? Is it attended? Um, or do we just lock the whole facility down all the time? Um, so the, the entire facility is like your locked cabinet. Um, and, um, and then how is it going to be destroyed and how long do you retain it? Some, um, some of your uh, customers may uh, require you to maintain it for a certain period of time, um, either in digital format or in hard copy format. Uh, how, what is that requirement? And then how will you destroy it digitally and physically? Um, you can't just put it in a regular shredder. If it's physical, you need to either incinerate it um, or have it um, go through a government approved shredder that, and I forget the, the, um, the actual size, but it's like super tiny and almost like dust. Um, there are services that do that, or you can buy the expensive like $2,000 shredder if you want to. Um, think also about how it flows out of the organization back to your customer, customers or to any subcontractors and make sure that that flow is also secured and compliant. Um, and, if, and if it flows out in hard copy format or if you have to give your client a, or customer a CD or something like that, how is it flowing out? Who is allowed to send it out of the organization? Who's authorized to do that? And then you create the data flow diagram. And this is a really high level way of visually seeing how that information travels. And this is huge. You cannot do an assessment and get a good POAM until you figure this part out. And so this is kind of like our little diagram that we use um, after we've collected all that information. So this is also key. Assure that you have a solid gap assessment. So Start with making sure that you 
confidently understand the spirit of the controls. If you read it and you keep, you say, I'm really not entirely sure what this means, then you need to get help because you can't guess because you're going to have an official assessment where they're going to have that expectation that you understand what that control means and not only what it means, but why the spirit of that control, what are they trying to accomplish here? So you're not just checking a box. It will also help you when you're trying to figure out a solution to be able to think more creatively about how to meet that control if you understand the spirit or how what it's trying to, to achieve. Have you assessed with rigor? So it doesn't mean that you go absolutely crazy with, um, with the assessment. It just needs to make sure that it's satisfactorily me meeting the controls. But have you actually done that? Or have you just been like, no, this, I think this is good. So we're just going to say that's met because an assessor is not going to do it that way. Um, is that organization and evidence organized? So when you do a gap assessment, it takes a massive effort, time and uh, brain power and um, your time to, to assess other people's time to, to, to do um, interviews and things of that nature. Um, and now you have this massive amount of information. Do you just have it in crazy spreadsheets all over the place or do you have it organized somewhere so you can actually use it? So once you have that fully populated poem, you're going to group those items into discrete projects. So you say, you look at all those poem items and you say, okay, I'm seeing here that we're going to need to replace our server. We're going to need to replace our firewall. And we're also going to need to replace our access points because those are, those are not using FIPS validated algorithms and we have CUI flowing over. Um, we, so, we, so whatever those projects are, and maybe it's a lack of documentation, uh, you write them all down and then link the POAM items to those projects. What's key here is that some items are going to list, link to several projects. So um, for instance, um, if you have uh, one of the controls on your POAM uh, about controlling access and you're going to need to implement um, on on-premises Active Directory and a server, um, you're also going to make sure that you have some kind of documentation and policy to be able to back up what it is you're doing and, and maybe even some baseline configurations for that server. So if you identify um, several different projects that link to that, make sure that you have that kind of clarity. So you know that when you've cleared all of those projects that you have cleared the POAM. And then when you have that list of projects, it allows you to estimate the one-time costs and the recurring costs. Because I do this all the time when we get to this part, um, I can easily ballpark for organizations because I've, I've learned a lot about their company as we're going through that process of um, interviews for how the data is flowing and the different programs that they use internally. So we can estimate those one-time costs. And also if there are things that we have to implement that would be recurring costs, like, um, like some kind of security software or support or something of that nature, we can estimate that too. And then that answers the question that everyone wants to know, how much is it going to cost? And then once you have that, then you can prioritize the projects based on cost so or improvement score. So um, what is the best way for you to approach it? That's organizationally driven. Do you want to try to um, you know, get that score like... Um, you know, what, what can we do to make the highest impact on our score the fastest? Or are you going to knock out some of like the smaller things to get some wins and then, you know, feel better about like, you know, maybe it's like onesies, twosies and points, but you can, you know, go through and knock out a bunch of smaller items. And then you feel like you have, you're making a lot of progress. So I've seen both approaches. You just have to under, uh, decide what it is that your organization feels the, um, the best about doing. And then um, you execute um, the program while you're implementing, so you, you execute the, pro, the, pro, the uh, projects while you're implementing your compliance program. Do not wait. I have seen this mistake too many times where an organization thinks, well, we're gonna start, you know, all we have to do is just do these projects. And then when we do the projects, we're done, we're compliant. And that's not the way that it works. A, a compliance program is continuous, like a safety program is continuous. You know, you don't just like arrive at safety and we're like, oh, we're done. We can close up our program. You have to implement the entire compliance program at the same time that you are closing those projects. 
um, that's not only important for you to do that so that um, you can continue to assure progress towards um, compliance, but also in your program, you're collecting evidence and data um, while those projects are going. I see organizations usually take somewhere between uh, 12 and 24 months to implement their CMMC program um, to, so that it's like completely up and running and all the projects are closed. So you don't wanna wait, you want to, to start it now. Okay, and then this is another important thing, it's key. So compliance programs have to assure that you have good documentation so you know what it is that you're following. Um, what kind of documentation? Well, anywhere you see a verb in the practices and the controls, that's an indication that they're looking for something in writing, whether it's a policy, a procedure, you know, a, a list of something. So what kinds of documents is the kinds of things? You need IT security policies. It, it references the requirement for policies on um, the different controls. Uh, we, um, our approach is to have one singular IT security policies document that's written to cover all the controls, uh, but also assure that you are, um, it's concise and, uh, and not too wordy or technical because really uh, beautifully written policies that nobody reads again are not going to help your organization to be compliant. Uh, you also want to assure you have an acceptable use policy that's end user facing. And uh, we oftentimes, we like to pull that out of the handbook and it be a standalone policy because it's really important that the, org that the people working on the computers understand their rights and responsibilities and consequences of the misuse of the, um, of the technology that they have access to or the information. And then we usually have them re-sign that actually every year when they do their annual training. You need a system security plan. So that's a requirement um, for, um, in this 800-171 and CMMC that you have a system security plan. And that plan should tell the story of how you've implemented the controls. You need an incident response plan, which is also detailed in um, DFAR 7012 and CMMC. You need a training and awareness plan, how you are going to train your people. Um, uh, we also recommend an information control and flow plan. Um, when we implement this, we don't just talk about the flow and control of CUI and FCI. Um, if we're going to go through all of this effort anyway, we take a step back and we look at all the information that the organization wants to protect, classify it, public and private, and the different levels of private information, and then how that's supposed to be uh, handled uh, so we have clarity because it doesn't take that much extra effort to have that conversation about what's important for us to protect in our organization. You also need an asset management plan. So asset management was a domain in CMMC1 that they dropped in CMMC2. And so people think that they don't need an asset management plan. But the fact of the matter is, they're still talking in those controls about a requirement for you to maintain lists of your inventory and configurations and uh, approved ports and protocols and um, to be able to classify those assets. Um, are they a CUI asset, a contractor risk managed asset, a security protection asset? So you still need to have lists of these things and a way to assure that they're being managed even though AM was dropped. Um, also, Every organization needs to have some kind of business continuity disaster recovery plan. doesn't matter if you need compliance or not. You need to assure that your company can continue to operate in the event of a disaster. And then the risk management plan is not called out in the controls, but we utilize that risk management plan um, as the cadence for us to assess uh, are we um, aligned with the controls? We have specific things that we do every single quarter. Um, and uh, there are agendas uh, and their SOPs to prepare for that meeting and assess and then realign the environment and collect evidence every single quarter. That way um, you can maintain your program because um, if you don't have some kind of a cadence, you, you'll just like, you'll have the best intentions to do the thing. But if you don't have that rigor of schedules and cadence, then you just end up saying, I'm gonna to get to that, I'm gonna to get to that, I'm gonna to get to that. And then you never get to that because life gets in the way and the fires get in the way. So you have to have a mechanism to be able to stay compliant. And then of course you need procedures, like a ton of these, right? So um, we're, in a minute we'll talk about what kinds of procedures. 
if you engage with an MSP or an MSSP to help with any of this, they need to have documentation too. What kind of documentation do you need to demand and assure that your provider has? Well, first they need to make sure that they have a shared responsibility matrix. That's going to say, if you engage them for this help, it's going to be specific then on um, what is it that, um, that they are responsible for and what is it that you're responsible for um, in the compliance management. Um, if you don't do that, then there could be things that are missed or you could make an assumption about who is supposed to be covering certain things and not recognize that, that there are things that you were supposed to do and you just assumed that your provider was supposed to do that. They also need their own IT security policies and those, those organizations will oftentimes be in scope of your CMMC assessment in some way. And where they're in scope, they need to be aligned with CMMC controls as well. Um, they also need to have an incident response plan. They better have an incident response plan because oftentimes their tool sets are in your network um, and that is a risk. Um, and they should also have a risk management plan as well, including the regular assessment of vendor risk. So oftentimes these organizations, they go through a lot of R&D to select their, um, their solutions that they will implement for you. And I believe that most of them do very, very good due diligence there. But then, off, then oftentimes they're not reassessing the risk of those vendors. And those vendors um, have things in your network. And so they need to demand that they're doing a regular risk assessment of the vendors that they've chosen. They also need to have a training and awareness plan because the engineers and the technicians um, may be in scope for your uh, assessment. And so they need to have regular training too for the role-based training. Um, so they need to have a, a business continuity and disaster recovery plan as well, because it's possible, depending on what you're relying on them for, that if they go down, you'll be dead in the water. And that's the last thing that you want. And they need to have procedures for a lot of different things where they're going to be in scope for your organization. Like if they're doing uh, new user configurations or new computer configurations, they need to have baseline configurations, which can be as simple as a checklist or an SOP for how the network equipment, the servers, the switches, all those things are configured. There must be a written change management process that needs to be understood and approved by you. Um, and they need to be um, some processes and procedures around uh, their remote monitoring and management tool. Those are the agents that are on all the computers um, because uh, there, that is also a risk to the organization. Um, and uh, be doing their own risk assessments um, and have procedures on those, procedures for maintenance, and then procedures for writing and updating the SSP. So what kind of procedures um, that are your, is your entire organization responsible for? Well, first of all, there will be some IT procedures that need to be written and maintained. There's HR procedures for um, onboard, transfer and off board. Um, and then there'll need to be some physical security procedures as well, such as, you know, how you're going to, what's your procedure for visitors that come to the, to your facility, processing them in um, and uh, being able to escort them around the facility. Um, and, uh, oh, this one actually, actually this one is not here. And, um, but you also have to consider um, procedures that would address um, handling the information, wait, there it is, never mind, it's there, uh, handling the information in physical and digital formats, um, as well as posting uh, to publicly accessible systems. Because as we all know, um, there is some information that you cannot post online. And I have seen um, GovCons that had contracts pulled because someone got excited and they posted on LinkedIn that they got a contract from, um, from a prime or from the government and it was, boom, gone. But documentation must be functional. You cannot just download something from the internet, throw your, um, your logo on it, you know, control F and then put your company name where it says company. They have to be functional. Um, they have to be able to be used in the organization. And if they're not functional, they will not be used. So um, be very, um, you need to have a good functional approach when you are writing the documentation. You also have to review it on a regular basis to assure that it is being followed and that it's still relevant. So determine if your documentation is going to be reviewed just in time, like when you are, for instance, configuring a computer, look at, is that 
SOP right? Um, or is it going to be reviewed on a rhythm? Like, and include that rhythm in your risk management process. Um, assessors are going to check the validity of your documentation by examine and or interview and or test. That will be the methodology that they use. So if they do that, if they look at your policy and then they go ask, well, I wanna to talk to you know, Susie in, um, in accounting to make sure she understands what the policy is for passwords. Um, will Susie in accounting know what that password policy is? Uh, and if it's not functional and you never review it, it's unlikely that they will. And then we go on to implementing the compliance program. Make sure beginning with the end in mind, communicate clearly with all the stakeholders, set meetings that you're going to discuss these things in advance, um, making sure that you are using some organization uh, method. Uh, we usually create tickets or tasks to make sure we stay on track with our compliance cadence. Um, always use agendas. I'm a huge, huge, crazy person when it comes to agendas. Don't show up to a meeting and then think that everyone has going to like re read your mind and know what you're going to talk about. That makes meetings inefficient and ineffective. So always have agendas that are provided in advance. Stay accountable. Assure that these things don't slip through the cracks. And I always tell people, don't try this without a GRC tool. Um, I use Future Feed. Um, we used to use spreadsheets and Word documents for the SSP and uh, is like, it's just so hard to keep track of everything and to keep it um, implemented, I'm sorry, to keep it up to date. Um, so I recommend um, selecting a, a GRC tool to store the information, the progress and the evidence of compliance. Um, I have literally demoed dozens of different tools for this and absolutely future feed is the best and it's built for CMMC. I don't get, I don't make any money from, from telling people about this. Um, but um, I'm actually like, they, I was just at a conference last week that they were one of the, uh, the hosts for this. And I'm telling you guys, like they are so committed to making companies successful uh, with implementing this. And um, they're a great organization to work with. Um, so when you're implementing your program, um, you, you wanna kick it off to get everyone excited. So, um, have some kind of uh, pre-kickoff meeting where you're talking about you know, what the kickoff is gonna be like and then have an actual kickoff or kicking off the program. Set a meeting cadence. So set the first risk management meeting, set the frequency of the documentation meetings so that you know like, which documentation you're gonna work on, when to get that, um, th that okayed and, and written and adopted. Um, determine the frequency of the remediation meetings where you're going to track the remediation of those projects. And that will probably be uh, more frequent than once a quarter. Um, and frequency of any IT team meetings. If you have an IT team who's going to be meeting with um, any vendors and then start your, your regular daily, weekly, monthly cadence of um, the specific activities that you're going to do uh, between the risk management meetings to assure that the environment stays compliant. Things like uh, maintenance and looking at logs and uh, checking backups, those kinds of things. Um, and then begin your regular quarterly risk management meeting cadence. So achieve, to achieve best outcomes, I've been doing this for a long time. And in my experience, um, to assure that you're getting best outcomes from your programs, don't be an island. Um, just assigning IT to manage the whole program alone, it's like, oh, this looks like an IT thing, it's up to you. Um, usually, uh, results in a failed program. Uh, make sure that management is engaged with this and has not just said, okay, well, I don't have to think about it anymore because Bob and IT is taking care of it. Um, and engage trusted partners to help. So that's gonna be partners who are going to be able to help you implement, maintain security solutions in order to meet compliance. Um, that might be um, somebody to help you with the compliance management. Um, and it might be somebody to help you with writing the documentation and uh, adopting that in the organization. So what do you do now? So if you have any questions, I'm here to help. I love talking about CMMC and helping organizations to get clarity on how to implement cybersecurity compliance programs. It's a passion for me. So if you'd like to, I'm offering everyone on this call the opportunity to jump on a no cost, no obligation, 20 minute call with me. And we'll identify where you are on the compliance journey, next steps, and link you with resources to be able to help. All you have to do is just email me, Leia at intechit.net with the subject 20 minute CMMC call. And then my lovely assistant, Sarah, will schedule that call with you. 
so that uh, we can get those answers to your questions and make you feel like you uh, either some good validation with where you are in your path or even point you in a direction so that you can um, accelerate what you're doing. All right, so that was how to implement the program. Do you have any questions? Oh, and don't forget to link with me, guys. If you're already not linked with me, please link with me on LinkedIn. Um, this is my email address and you can find me on Signal and WhatsApp um, as well to be able to link with me there. Doesn't look like we have any questions. So um, thank you for coming today. You've been a wonderful audience. And if there's anything else we can help you with, please let us know and see you around compliance land. Stay secure.